Last week, we dove into Hebrews chapter 7, and we looked at this character by the name of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a character in the Old Testament where in the Old Testament, there's like three verses mentioned about him in the entire Old Testament, but then the writer of Hebrews takes an entire chapter and talks about this guy and the significance of this guy. Um, and he says that Melchizedek is a shadow of Jesus. He's a shadow that's foretelling what Jesus is like. Only things we know about Melchizedek is he's a priest. He's a king of Salem. Um, Salem is, um, means peace, um, so he's a king of peace. We don't know anything about his father. We don't know anything about his mother. We don't know his background, where he grew up. We don't know a history about him. All we know is he's a king and a priest. He shows up. He blesses Abraham. Abraham gives him 10%, and David prophetically says that Jesus will be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And the writer of Hebrew picks up on that and expounds on the entire teaching and says Melchizedek is a shadow foretelling about who Jesus is. And he contrasts that with the Levites. The Levites were the priests in the nation of Israel. They were, came out of the tribe of Levi, and they were appointed by God to serve as the priests for the people. They would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people so that God would cover their sins. And so the Levites, the only way you can be a priest was if you were born into the family of Levi. You couldn't go up and sign up to be a priest. You had to be born into the family. So if your dad was a priest, you would become a priest. It went on from generation to generation. And so what the writer wants us to understand is that Melchizedek is a shadow, and he's pointing to Jesus, the real king of righteousness, the real prince of peace, the real priest forever. And with that, I want to turn your attention to Hebrews 8, and I want to read the first six verses of Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, verses 1 through 6. Now, the point of what I'm saying is this. We have such a great high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it's necessary for this priest also to have to offer something. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve as a copy or a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant that he mediates is better, since it's erected, enacted on better promises. So all of the information that we received in chapter 7, all of the stuff that we were told about Melchizedek is pointing to this idea. And he, the writer of Hebrews says, here's the main point. Here's why I am telling you all of this. Because we have such a high priest. We have such an incredible high priest. Melchizedek and all of that's about him, he just points us to Jesus. And Jesus is such a better high priest. In chapter 8, 9 and 10 is going to teach us um, and develop the idea that Jesus offers a better covenant, Jesus gives us better promises, Jesus um, serves in a better place, that what we have in Jesus is so much better. And the writer is reminding us, listen, what you used to have, what you used to be, Jesus is so much more amazing. Jesus is so much better what we have in Jesus is better than what anything the world could ever give us. And he teaches us several things about Jesus here. First, we see the moral adequacy of Jesus. We see that Jesus was the, such a high priest. In the Old Testament, in the Levites, the Levites, the high priest, would go and make a sacrifice once a year for the sins of the people on the Day of Atonement. But before he could make the sacrifice for the people, he would have to make a sacrifice for himself. He was a sinful man. He would... He had sins in his life, and so he had to make sacrifices on his own behalf. And only when he made those sacrifices could he enter into the Holy of Holies and make sacrifices for the people. See, he was sinful. But Jesus didn't have to make multiple sacrifices. He didn't have to make a sacrifice for himself. He, didn't have to, he just had to make one sacrifice, and he does it once and for all. He only had to make sacrifice because he was perfect. There was nothing wrong about him. There was no blemish in him. He was pure. He was holy. And the writer of Hebrews says, we have such a high priest. 
We don't have someone who's morally flawed. We don't have someone who needs grace himself. We have someone who lived the life that we should have lived, who walked on the earth, who did the things we were supposed to do, but he was able to live it the way we should have lived, but we were never able to live. And so when he makes the sacrifice, he makes the perfect sacrifice because he was adequate, morally adequate to do it. The second thing that the writer says is that not only is Jesus morally adequate, but where is Jesus seated? He's seated in the heavens. See, and he contrasts what the Levites used to do with what Jesus is doing. The Levites in the sanctuary in the Old Testament, there was no seats. There was no chairs in the sanctuary because they were always busy. They're always working. They're always making sacrifices. It's sacrifice after sacrifice, day after day. They're just busy, working, going at it. Some of you guys who are moms, who have little kids, you know what it's like. It's like you never can finish a task for the day because there's always stuff to do. And that's the idea of what the writer of Hebrews is saying about the Levites. These guys are always busy. There's so many people that have sins. There's so many people that need sacrifices. And these guys, they don't even have time to put a chair in the sanctuary because they're so busy. But he contrasts that with Jesus. Jesus isn't standing working. He's sitting. He's seated on the throne. He says he makes his sacrifice once and for all, and now he takes a seat to demonstrate the finality of everything that he's accomplished for us. He says, when I did it, it is once and for all. I don't have to do it ever again. Let me illustrate. Every time the Levites had to make a sacrifice, all it did was simply put a Band-Aid on the sin. It never took the sin away. It just simply put a Band-Aid on it. It just kind of like if I, every time I sinned, if I sinned, all it do is create a mark on my hand. I know a lot of you guys can't see that, but there's a black mark on my hand. And what the Levites would do was every time they would make a sacrifice, they would basically take a Band-Aid, if I can get this open, and they would cover it up. So you can't see the band you can't see the stain, but there's a stain there. Eventually, after a while, the Band-Aid begins to wear off, and the sin is still there. The stain is still there. But what Jesus does, sorry, is he just completely cleans it off. It's no longer there. And he doesn't have to do it multiple times. He doesn't have to do it um, year in and year out. He does it once and for all. And he does it for your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. And now he sits because his work is finished. The Levites have to keep working, but Jesus says, when I made the ultimate sacrifice, it is for once and for all, and you never have to see me sacrificing on your behalf again. I don't have to come back and die for you over and over. When I did it, it was for your past, your present, and your future. Here's what the writer is saying. Jesus is the real deal. He's the real deal. You're not going to get any better than him. You will never find anyone superior to him. He is the real deal. Notice also where Jesus is seated. He's seated on a throne. That's not where priests sit. In fact, a priest, they don't ever have time to sit, but if they sat, they wouldn't sit on a throne. That was reserved for kings. That was reserved for people of royalty. And so the only person that could sit on a throne was a person in the order of Melchizedek who was a priest and a king. And so now Jesus sits as our priest interceding on our behalf also as our king, ruling over our lives. We've got a great high priest, but we also have a king of kings. Then we turn to verse 2, and it gets really, really good from here to verse 6. In verse 2, the author says that Jesus is a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. And what he, the writer does, he takes us all the way back to Exodus 25, from verses 2 to verse 5. He takes us all the way back to Exodus, where God is talking to Moses on the mountain, and God's speaking to him, and he gives him instruction. He says, this is how I want you to set up the tabernacle. This is how I want you to set up the sanctuary. And he says, he gives detail by detail instruction. It says, I need it to be this size. I need it to be of this wood. I need it to be of this um, length. And he gives all of these details. It is specific to the point. And he warns him. He says, you better be careful that you do it according to the pattern that I give you. See, when you hear that, 
you would think there's something bigger going on. Why is God so detailed about a building? Why is God so giving so much information, inch by inch, length by length, color and size, all of these details? And the writer of Hebrews expands on that and says, what the Israelites were building was a replica of the sanctuary in heaven. The sanctuary that the Israelites built, it looked exactly like what it looked like in heaven. So the Levites who were building all of this stuff, Moses and those who were helping, were constructing a tabernacle that was an exact replica of what God constructs in the heaven. So the Levites who were busy offering sacrifices on a daily basis with no remedy, no permanent remedy for our sins, are doing all of this in a place that's a shadow or a replica of the real thing. The Levites are a shadow of what to come, offering sacrifices in the shadow of the real tabernacle. But Jesus, on the other hand, is the real deal, the real high priest, the real king of kings, and he is in the real tabernacle in heaven, constructed by God, performing a unique ministry that only he can perform. He's not a shadow. He's not fake. He's not an image of something else. He's the real deal. In fact, in verse 3, the writer of Hebrews tells us that he can't be a priest here on earth at all. And we said this earlier. The only way that you could be a priest in the Old Testament was if you were born into the tribe of Levi. But Jesus wasn't born into the tribe of Levi. He was born into the tribe of Judah. So if Jesus was on the earth, he would never be able to be a priest. The only way that he could be a priest was if he was in ministering in a sanctuary that was different from the sanctuary that was here. So he is in heaven ministering in the real sanctuary as the real high priest interceding on our behalf because, listen, Jesus is the real deal. He's the real thing. You cannot get better than him. No matter what the world offers you, whether it's mon money or success or fame, Jesus says, I am so much better than that. What I offer you, even if you've got to suffer and go through pain and anguish, the things that I promise you and guarantee you are so much better than what the world gives. See, Jesus is not like the Levites at all. Jesus is a high priest and a king unlike the world has ever seen. That's why the passage tells us that Jesus has obtained a mi better ministry. In verse 6, he expounds on this and he says, but as it is, Jesus has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it's enacted on better promises. What Jesus is doing as our high priest in the real tabernacle is a much better ministry than what's being accomplished in the shadow. It is what God has planned, but he planned it as a shadow to point us toward Jesus. So when Jesus carries out his ministry, we can experience the promise of God in the best possible way. See, this is a superior ministry that is conveying a better covenant, and Jesus is the mediator of that covenant. Let me unpack verse 6 for you because there's so much good truth in here. Jesus is our mediator. That means he's acting as an agent between us and God. He is between two parties to get them on the same page. He's using the avenue of a covenant, which is a basis of a relationship. And Jesus stands between these two parties, God on one side, us on the other side, as he's mediating between the two of us. And he's working between us so that we can come together on the basis of this covenant. The covenant is built on particular promises. So there are promises that are made to create a relationship between us and God where before we had no relationship. And Jesus mediates so that both parties can come together. Let me illustrate. Several years ago, 2006 or so, we went to go visit my in-laws in Dubai and had an incredible time there. But on the way back, I ended up getting food poisoning on the plane. And for 17 hours of the flight, I was incredibly sick. Fever, everything, nothing was going right for me. And I've got a little infant baby at the time, and my wife is holding the baby on one hand, picking up suitcases. It was a nightmare. I get back, um, I'm not getting any better. The doctor sends me to the hospital, 
they admit me in the hospital for a week, all over eating eggs on Emirates Airlines. And for a week, I end up in the hospital. They have IVs on me. They've got, they're just poking me. They won't give me any rest. They're just bothering the life out of me while my wife is at home taking care of the baby. After a week, I get to go home. Several weeks later, I get a bill from the insurance company for the hospital. The bill was not pretty. It was a huge amount. Several people advised us that we should go after the airlines to at least pay for the hospital bill. So we did. We hired an attorney, and the attorney sued the airlines. And so the, um, eventually the airlines came to us and said, we're not going to settle with you. We're not going to court. We need to mediate this. So we end up in a room in downtown Dallas. I'm in one room with my attorneys. The airline attorneys are in their room with their attorneys. And there's this mediator guy in between. And the mediator guy will go between my room and their room, coming back with terms. And so we, they went back and forth and back and forth. For several hours, they kept going back and forth with us. And eventually, the only thing I got out of it was they paid some portion of my hospital bill, but not all of it. I didn't get rich. I wasn't able to retire off of it. All I got was my hospital bill paid off. And, but the mediator in between would constantly come in and say, here's what the airline is offering. Are you happy with that? Are you content with that? I would say, no way. And then they'd go back and say, they're not content. Here's what they're offering. And they would come back and say, the airline doesn't want it. Um, and so we'd go back and forth until both of us could get to the same page. That's what a mediator does. But listen, that's not what Jesus does. When the Bible says that Jesus is our mediator, that's not what he's doing at all. That's not how this plays out biblically for us. Listen, me and you, we don't have a right to come to the table of God. We don't deserve to even be able to sit across the table with God. So when Jesus mediates, what he is doing is he is allowing us, because of what he has done, to even be able to face God, to even be able to sit in the same room as God. Jesus being the mediator means he has created a place for you at the table, where before you had no idea what the table even looked like, where you had no right or access to God, Jesus says, listen, I'm making a table for you. I'm creating a seat for you. You are now welcome to come and sit. Why? Because he's the one who offered his life for us. He creates a place at the table for us. And now we don't come in bargaining and negotiating because we know we don't even deserve to be there. We're not saying, God, give me this or give me that. We come in saying, God, thank you for even letting me sit at the table with you. Thank you for letting me even be there. See, if we came in negotiating or bargaining, the relationship is going to come from our heart. And our heart is messed up, isn't it? We want things that make us happy and satisfied and content. So God doesn't even allow us to negotiate. He says, I'm going to give you stuff from my heart. I'm going to give you things that I desire for you. And the things that I desire for you are so much better than what you could ever come up with. God's heart is for us to know him, to walk with him. Because Jesus paid the price for us so that we could be in his presence and we can know him. See, this is an amazing thing that Jesus is mediating for us because this agreement comes from the heart of God. It's provided for us by God. It's sacrificed by Jesus so that we can sit at the table of God. So when we come to the table, we're getting something we never deserved. We're getting something that we should not even even ponder on meditating or thinking that we could ever get. God gives us something so much better. We're getting an opportunity to experience a relationship with God that is better than anything else that all of history could give us. Think about the Old Covenant. Think about the people in the Old Testament. God wants to interact to his people through Moses and through the sacrificial system that the Levites enacted. Remember, it's just a shadow. It's just a reflection of something that's better. The closest that they could ever get was through these sacrifices. The closest that anyone could get to God was the high priest. And once a year, he could go into the Holy of Holies 
and be in the presence of God. But everyone else, they can get to the outer courts of the sanctuary, to, to the area where God was, but they can never get to God because they were restricted because of their sins. But because Jesus is your high priest, something fantastic happens. The agreement of the relationship, the basis of the relationship, the promises on which it was based are spectacular. And over the next several weeks, we're going to dig into this and we're going to expound on this and we're going to see what Jesus did for us. But let me give you a taste of some of these promises. Promise number one. God promises that if you enter into an agreement with him, he's going to give you a brand new heart. This heart that is so selfish, so messed up, so corrupt, that only wants what I want, God says, I'm going to remove that out of you, and I'm going to put a new heart in you, a heart that wants to know me, a heart that wants to be in relationship with me, that heart that wants to do the things I tell of you. I'm going to give you a new heart. Promise number one, God's going to give you a new heart. Promise number two, that you're not going to just get into the proximity of God, you're not just going to be in the area where God is, but because he's given you a new heart, that he's going to actually come and take residence in your heart. He's going to live inside of you. He's going to be with you everywhere you go. He's going to guide you so that when you don't know what to do, you can pray and he can give you wisdom to do the right thing. When you don't know how to make the right decision, he's right there saying, go this way, do this, don't do that. He's not just going to be someone that's distant. He's going to live inside of you. Promise number three, if God's going to give you a new heart, if God's going to live inside of you, he can only live in a clean place, so he is going to forgive of your sins past, present, and future. He is forgives all of it. These are the promises that we have now because of the sacrifice of Jesus. These are what this is what Jesus has done on our behalf. Listen, this is the best of the best, and I keep emphasizing this. Jesus is the real deal. There's nothing you can do that's better than what he has done for you. There's nothing that you can work at to say, God, look at what I've done that compares to what Jesus has already done for you. If you take a bunch of honeybees and you put them in an environment where all they could get is artificial flowers, no real flowers, just artificial. No matter how hard the bees worked, no matter how hard they buzzed, no matter how hard they labored and toiled, they're never going to find nectar because it's artificial. And if you don't find nectar, you're never going to be able to produce honey. They can be as busy as they want to be, but there's no honey that's going to be produced. See, that's the picture of what the Old Testament Levites were doing. They were busy. They were buzzing around like busy bees, making sacrifices after sacrifices. But they could never produce permanent remedy for our sins. They can never produce one ounce of eternal life. But Jesus comes in and he makes this once and for all sacrifice on our behalf. And he offers us real eternal life so that anyone who draws near to God can experience the real deal, can experience his life. See, this is, Jesus wants to offer us what's real. He doesn't want us to live in the shadow. He doesn't want to us to live on something that will never satisfy us. See, when you make him the Lord of your life, he invites you into something that changes your life forever. You know, I've been communicating this message year after year that Jesus is so much better. We preach that constantly here. You would think that after a while, it would get old, but it doesn't because it's the real deal. Because, because Jesus has changed my life. He has transformed me where I had been destroying my life. But by the grace of God, he came and rescued me. He saved me from my sins, made me his son, made me a part of his family. So this message never gets old because it wasn't because of what I did. But in his grace and his mercy, he saved me. Jesus is the real deal. See, what you're going to discover is that when Jesus is your high priest... 
is that the real life, that it, what you get right now is an amazing and life-changing as it is right now. All the blessings you get, it's simply a taste of what's coming. Simply a taste of what he has planned for us. My kids were in Philadelphia and Virginia for two months this summer. And they were gone for quite a while. And we missed them tremendously. So at least two or three times a week, we would jump on Skype and we would talk to them. We would see their faces on Skype and they would tell us about their day and they'll tell us how they get to eat whatever they want and um, sleep whenever they want and how much their grandparents are spoiling them. And we would watch them. We would just get so excited about seeing them on this computer screen. But you know what? My excitement was there to see them, but there was a, a bigger excitement because I knew this screen was temporary, that there was a day coming when I was getting them back in my arms, that they were going to be back home with me, that I didn't have to look at a screen to see them, that I would get to see them face to face. And Jesus says that the life that we have now, all of the ways he's blessed us right now, the blessings that he has showered upon us, his presence with us, his blessings on us, his provision in our lives, all of that is good, it's amazing, we don't deserve it, but that's just a Skype screen because there's a day coming where we're gonna see him face to face. All of this is good right now, but the real deal is still on its way. See, I don't know much about art, but in 2011, there was this painting that was sold, that, there was this painting that was sold called the card player. It was painted by Paul Cezanne in the late 1800s. The nation of Qatar, they've got so much money they don't know what to do with it, um, spent $250 million to buy this painting. $250 million. This, I looked at the painting yesterday online just to see what it looked like. I guarantee you it was drawn in a high school classroom. It doesn't look that complicated. But the nation bought it for $250 million. None of us in this room can afford it. But here's the good deal. Here's the good news. If you wanted a copy of it, you can actually get an oil painting replica of the card player for about $150. So for $150, you can get a $250 million painting in your living room. But here's the problem. Your $150 million painting is just a shadow of the real deal. It's not the real thing. Listen, outside of Jesus, the best that we could ever do with our lives is $150. That's about it. But because of what he's done, because of the price that he's paid, what we receive is not $250 million. It's priceless. It's absolutely priceless. And there is nothing that you and I did to get it the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't that God looked at us and said, oh, David looks like he's doing such a good job, I'll save him. Or Stephen's doing such a great job, I'll save him. That's not what he did. It's not that any of us were doing a good job. We were a mess. And Jesus saved us. He called us to be a part of his family. He made us his sons, his daughters. He made us co-heirs with Jesus, which means that everything Jesus gets, we get. The honor that Jesus gets is the honor that we receive. The love that the Father showers upon Jesus is the love that the Father showers upon us because of Jesus. He is the real deal. I know there's not a lot of practical application in this morning's message, but listen, when, when this sinks into your heart and your life, it transforms everything about you. It transforms how you live because he's the real deal. And we don't have to live in the shadows. We don't have to chase the imaginary. We received the real deal. This morning, we're about to celebrate the Lord's table. The Lord's table reminds us 
what I just said. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So as we come to the table, we recognize that the ultimate price was paid on our behalf. Jesus paid the sacrifice so that we could have a relationship with God. And so in a few moments, I'm going to ask you to examine your heart, examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires. If there's anything in your life that's not like Jesus, that dishonors God, would you repent? Would you confess? Here's the good news. You have a high priest who is interceding for you. He will hear your prayers. He will forgive. He will wash you new. There is no black stains on your body. It is washed clean. So when you examine your heart, the way we do communion here is that after you have examined your life, you are welcome to come to the table, grab the elements, and come back to your seats, and in a few moments, we will partake of it together. But would you examine your hearts, your actions, your affections, your desires, and see if there's anything unlike Jesus? If there is, would you run to him? Would you repent? And then let's celebrate what he has done for us together. Would you join me in prayer? Father, this morning, Thank you that we have such a great high priest. Thank you that he has paid the sacrifice so that we could receive the benefits that we don't deserve. And thank you that we don't re receive the wrath that we do deserve. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us. We give you our lives. Let it reflect the greatness of our King. In Jesus' name.